What do you mean, have a crack at it? I'd like to program it for you. Develop it. I wouldn't interfere with the actual news itself, but TV is showbiz, Max. And even the news has to have a little showmanship. Everything that was discussed about television in that movie has happened, except we haven't killed anybody on the air yet. That's the only thing that hasn't happened, deliberately. Uh, but other than that, everything has happened. News as entertainment. The president let somebody else talk. The president let somebody else You know what I like about this hologram, and you're a hologram now, Jessica. With the stock now trading slightly below its IPO price. The cheese is underneath the hamburger. Oh my god, it's worse than I ever imagined. Patty Chayefsky's classic 1976 film, Network, tells the story of Howard Beale, a TV news anchor who goes a little bit crazy and starts actually telling the truth on TV. He is soon exploited by an ambitious programming executive named Diana Christensen, which angers Max Schumacher, the head of the news division who believes the news should remain pure. The film correctly predicts how damaging the impulse to make everything on TV entertaining would be to the integrity of the news, and how making entertainment the only qualification for being on TV would allow fringe groups to push themselves into the mainstream. It's a biting satire, and when it was first released, the TV industry hated it. Paul Friedman, a producer of The Today Show, called it unfair. Newscaster Edwin Newman said that TV producers wouldn't stoop so low for ratings and that there's evidence that the opposite is true. The president of CBS News said it was just such a caricature. It simply couldn't happen. The American people want somebody to articulate their rage for them. I think it's safe to say that we're living in Chayefsky's nightmare. But considering how sharp and prophetic his film turned out to be, it's almost hard to believe just how much he doubted the content of the story as he wrote it. In 2001, the New York Public Library acquired a bunch of notes that Chayefsky made while writing the film that give us an extraordinary glimpse into his writing process. Specifically, they reveal his struggles in handling an ever-sprawling story and deciding on an ending, clarifying the themes of the allegory, and figuring out where the love story would fit. Network is an ambitious film, and one of the biggest troubles Chayefsky had when writing the script was balancing his ambition with what could be accomplished in a story. In his book on the production of the film, Mad as Hell, David Skoff notes that Chayefsky had wanted to tell a story that was global in its scope, from the continent-spanning clashes of governments and corporations to the atomic-level collisions of mere people. But as he wrote, his cast of characters inflated and he struggled to figure out a logical way to bring it it all to a close. Most of the many ideas he rejected sound way too complicated and too detached from the main characters to make sense in a story. Ideas like, by the end of the picture, all the networks will have been bought by other multinationals. Or, what if the multinational corporations declare war on Chile? That's kind of random. Or what if the revolutionary group kidnapped Beale as a way of attracting attention to their group? Compared to these big, complicated sequences, the ending he actually ended up picking seems quaint. In the finished film, Beale's ratings tank when his delivery takes a more depressing turn. Unable to cancel the show because the president of their parent company likes it, the network decides to have Beale assassinated. He is... The end. It's a simpler ending, but it can be because it's allegorical. In an allegory, everything in the story is a stand-in for something else in the real world. And every character and incident in Network has an allegorical meaning. In the ending, Beale is assassinated by a group of communist radicals who Diana has given their own TV show. So by having the Network hire them to do the killing, it shows how corporations can co-opt any ideology to serve their profit-driven motives. The ending may not be global in scope, as Chayefsky originally intended, at least not in the actions recorded on film, but it is as far as what it's saying as an allegory. So these two problems actually end up being the same problem, because the biggest issue that Chayefsky faced when putting together the screenplay was figuring out exactly what he wanted it to say thematically, and finding a method to express that in a story. 
At the top of one page, Shaevsky writes, the show lacks a point of view. We are making some kind of statement about American society, and its lack of clarity is what's bothering me. Even more, I'm not taking a stand. I'm not for anything or anyone. Later he writes that the story has no ultimate statement beyond the idea that a network would kill for ratings, and even that doesn't mesh with the love story and whatever the love story says thematically. So how did Chayefsky solve these issues? Well, it's difficult to say definitively since it's hard to pinpoint how far along he was in the process when he felt this way, but I think his solution is to make the love story the focus of the allegory. In the finished film, Max Schumacher represents hard, honest journalism, while Diana Christensen represents the corrupting influence of television. Though he falls in love with her, he leaves her once he concludes that she is incapable of love. Your television incarnate Diana, indifferent to suffering, insensitive to joy. All of life is reduced to the common rubble of banality. Allegorically, the message couldn't be clearer. We, the people who want the news to remain honest, have to reject Diana's version of television. Otherwise, we'll be degraded as she is. If I stay with you, I'll be destroyed. Like Howard Beale was destroyed. Like everything that you and the institution of television touch is destroyed. But in his notes, it didn't start out this way. He initially referred to Max as hotshot, and his place in the allegory was exactly the opposite. He was gonna be a young news producer who is hired to bring his hit tabloid format to an ailing network newscast. It's only later that Chayefsky recasts him as a 50-year-old president of the network news division, a tough but righteous fellow. This version of the character was divorced, unlike the final version, who's still married, but most importantly, he sees himself as someone who upholds the highest traditions of journalism. This character would then battle against a regional news director who resembles the hotshot Max was originally going to be. Later, Chayefsky added a love interest for Max who is very different from the love interest he ends up having in the finished movie. He describes her as a no-bullshit girl who sees through all of Max's high-principled bullshit, a character who would come to represent the virtuous path he needed to follow. I think it's here that Chayefsky ran into trouble with the allegory and figuring out just what the love story meant. After all, if Max is already someone who respects the highest traditions of journalism, how can a romance with a virtuous girl help him get where he already is ideologically? There's no conflict there, nothing for him to learn from her. Chayefsky's solution is to combine the hotshot adversary character with the love interest character. Now we've got an interesting push and pull. He's attracted to her physically and emotionally, but morally repulsed by her. It's this dynamic that forms the backbone of the story and clarifies its allegorical message. Great stories are not born fully formed, but it's rare for us to have such a clear picture of how one was formed, to see a creator's reasons for every decision they made along the way. And I think I think there's great value in that, both because of the lessons we can draw from asking why he made these decisions, and as a reminder that art gets better over time. Though he won three Academy Awards for screenwriting, Chayefsky maintained that writing was just work. Perseverance counts more than talent. He once said, stop thinking of writing as art. Think of it as work. If you're an artist, whatever you do is going to be art. If you're not an artist, at least you can do a good day's work. This video is sponsored by Verve. If you haven't heard of it, Verve is a great streaming service that packages together a bunch of other channels that you may have heard of. And if you click the link in the description, you'll get a 30 day free trial. So check it out, especially if you like anime because they've got channels like Crunchyroll and Funimation that are filled with excellent animes, shows like Attack on Titan and My Hero Academia. Right now I'm watching Cowboy Bebop on Verve, which is wonderful because I can't count the number of times that show has been recommended to me and I finally get to watch it. I'm also glad that they've added Mubi to their roster of channels since it's filled with indie movies that you might not otherwise get a chance to see. So it's a great deal for cinephiles like me. For a limited time, you can go to verve.co slash just right or click on the link in the description to get a 30 day free trial of Verve Premium. Oh yeah, and they've got the new season of Harmon Quest on there too if you need another reason. If you like this video and want to see more videos on movies and writing, literary history and criticism, then make sure to go over to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash just right and you can support this channel for as little as $1 a video to help ensure that 
that this channel keeps going. I want to thank all my current patrons for continuing to support this work. Thanks for watching everyone, I'll see you soon, and keep writing.